We're going to be learning a lot from a little-known guy <laughs> this morning. Um, we're going to look at somebody's life uh, that there's very not very much information about, uh, but the information that's there, I think, is uh, really good stuff. Um, you can learn a lot from him. Uh, his name is, drum roll please, Zechariah. Okay. And the lesser known one, not the guy with the book. It's from Luke chapter 1. But anyway, I was thinking with all these things that are currently going on, you know, with all this pandemic y stuff, right? Um, it's easy to feel a bit lonely, a bit stressed maybe even a bit isolated. I think it's great that things are opening up, even here in Maine. <laughs> Our limits are going to be increasing soon, and uh, you know we've never, thankfully, had too much of an issue with that, but I know it's been a lot of trouble for a lot of other places. But not just that, the culture, the complications, the uncertainty with the economy, everything, you know. Sometimes you can feel a little bit down, right? Little, like we're losing some hope. Um, I can imagine that that same kind of feeling happens to all kinds of folks and people that go through hard times, go through challenges that they never anticipated going through, even generational challenges. And I, and I was thinking about the people of Israel, um, how they probably felt like they had been losing hope uh, before Jesus came into the world, their culture had been threatened. They were dealing with being a Roman client state. There were probably a lot of them wondering, will deliverance ever come? Will there ever be anybody? Will God's... So many prophecies about God's will. Will they ever come true? That, we'll, that they'll receive a deliverer? And this morning... I'm going to talk about Zacharias, or Zechariah, depending on your translation of your Bible. If you've got a King James Version, you probably get Zacharias. It's because in Greek, uh, it is Zacharias, but the Hebrew pronunciation of his name is Zechariah. Uh, so um, that, that's, that's basically why there's two different names, depending on your translation. But they're, they're pretty close. But we're going to talk about this guy. Um, his story is often read over or overlooked, I think. You know, we, we don't really stop too much. It's only in one gospel, right? Um, and I, I, I think we can learn a lot from his experience with God and uh, what happened afterward. I think uh, it might enrich our lives as Christians and might encourage us in our own difficult times on how to deal with things and deal with emotions and stress and everything else. Um... I think that his name is the first thing we, we can learn some things about him. Uh, Zechariah, his name means the Lord remembers. And it's with Zechariah that God's plan to bring Christ into the, into the world is set into motion. That's when it gets revealed to a person for the first time. Like, it's happening now, you know. Um, and if you think about the people... Judea, they had a long history of falling in and out of favor with God, being corrected and then falling away again. They were carried into exile by the Babylonians. They were uh, able to go home under the Persians, but then they were subjugated uh, by the Greeks. And for a very long time, it was looking like their culture was going to be ex extinguished by Hellenization. Um, and, and, and when you read in, in the biblical account, even um, in the Gospels, there is that the, those two things happening at the same time. You read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, the Sadducees were Hellenized Jews that, that really believed very little of what um, their own faith had taught them. Uh, they, they had bought whole uh, part and parcel into uh, Jewish culture, I mean, uh, Greek culture and Roman culture. But anyway, so they, they, the, their people, they gained independence for like a hundred years, and then they were subjugated again by the Romans. They were a Roman client state, they paid tribute and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
And at the time when Jesus died, they even had a Roman governor. Um, but it was at this time that God made himself known to Zechariah uh, through an angel, Gabriel. Um, it is if, if to say to those reading and those wanting to know if the Lord would ever answer the call that God does remember. He's not forgotten. He didn't forget his people Israel. He didn't forget us either. God knows us. He knows our way of life. He knows our self-determination. And even though sometimes when we might feel like our own worship, our own freedoms, might be under threat for whatever reason, God still remembers us. He knows us. He knows about every hair on our head. I think that it's a deep thought when you really begin to let it churn around in there and let it marinate in your brain that God doesn't forget. He doesn't forget about his people. If we think about all the things that we're going through right now, it's easy to forget that, that God remembers you. And God hasn't forgotten about you. That he's always there. God always remembers his people. And we have the Bible to tell us about all the times when he came and he delivered them, right? Right? If you look all the way back to Abraham, God made a covenant with him to make his descendants as numerous as the stars. It says in Genesis 15, 5, it says, And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Well, God made his promise and he did not forget. After 400 years had passed, the descendants of Abraham became a people down in Egypt in the land of Goshen. And it was this people who would eventually enter into the promised land. But these once proud people who had once conquered the promised land by the will and power of God had been brought low in the time of Zechariah. They were waiting for the coming of a deliverer, a Messiah, to deliver them. And that plan is set into motion with Zechariah himself, the father of John the Baptist. God remembered his people, and God gave his own son, Jesus Christ, to deliver them. And he chose Zechariah's son to introduce Jesus Christ to the world. God remembers Zechariah, I think we can learn a lot from this simple name that the Lord does, in fact, remember us. <clears throat> you know, I, I think if we are feeling aimless and we don't know what the future will hold, we're looking for some sense of direction in our life, a purpose, a reason, anything, then we can find those things in our belief and our trust in God, and his promises, and his deliverance. And that God will give us those things if we are patient. That's another thing. You know, the people of Israel had to wait 400 years in Egypt, and then when they got out of Egypt, they had to wait another 40 years in the desert because they didn't believe him, right? So that comes back on us. So do we believe God? Do we have our faith and our trust in Him? Are we willing to be patient? Are we willing um, to give God deference in things in our own life? Because God knows our struggles, He knows our plight, He hears us, and He's going to deliver us. He's going to be there for us when the time is right. And God knows when that is. We don't. You know, Paul pretty much says the same thing. Uh, if we look at Romans 5, 6 through 8, he says, For why we were still helpless, so for while, while uh, we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us at the right time. At the right time. God knows what your right time is. It's up to us to be patient and to wait for it. it you know, we need to wait on the Lord, right? God has his own timing. God has the master plan. He's not like the uh, receptionist at the doctor's office, right? Or the dentist's office. The Lord remembers, you know? You ever go to the doctor's office and you end up, it'll be 15 minutes and you're there for 45 and you're like, what's going on? You go up and like, oh, we forgot that you were here. <laughs> you know? I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it seems to happen to me a lot. I don't know why. Maybe I just got like one of those faces that's easily forgettable. <laughs> I don't know. But that's not the way that God sees you. That's not what God thinks. You know, the Lord remembers. Zechariah, right? So if you're going through something hard right now, know that God is with you and that he is there to help you to get through it. But sometimes we have to put a a little bit of trust in God and be patient, don't we? We have to have faith that his timing's right, not our own timing. And as we read, Zechariah has to be patient too. And, and, and he forgets to be patient. We're going to read a little bit about that. But let's, let's first talk about what kind of characteristics Zechariah and his wife had. It says in Luke 1.6 that Zechariah and his wife are called righteous before God and their observance of God's law is blameless. So they are righteous and blameless before God. And one could safely assume that they were a strong, believing family. They trusted in the Lord so much that they made his ways their ways. They were mindful to do what God had commanded them to do. So much so that the scripture, the God's word, calls them righteous and blameless. I don't think we can question that. But even Zechariah, a righteous and blameless guy, forgets what his name means. You know, the Lord remembers. Uh, and is not necessarily super patient. And he has doubts, right? Zechariah has some doubts. And I think that's true of all of us. How, how many people have felt doubt at one point in their life? Is all this real? Well, I think when we really think about it, what God can do, um, it, it's a truly amazing thing, but sometimes we forget, don't we? We forget, and, and uh, we have doubts. You know, when we think, oh, you know, we see some scientific whatever that talks about all the things that are impossible for there to be a God and atheism and all that kind of stuff, and you see that being pushed as a narrative in the culture, and you're like, how could all these people be wrong, you know? But you look at all the answers that they don't have. And you look at all the people that don't agree. And you begin to understand that atheism and everything else that goes along with it is not an answer. It's just a religion. It's a belief system that believes in nothing. It believes in no hope, only death and destruction. There's nothing beyond it other than getting what you can until you get out. And that's all there is. But anyway, that's a little bit going off the beaten track. We're talking about Zechariah, aren't we? And we're talking about the, the promise that is made to Zechariah here in Luke 1, 11 through 13. It says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right hand of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. Zacharias has been praying. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and will give and you will give him the name John. John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. John the Immerser. So Gabriel told Zachariah that he have a son, but a long time had passed, so much time had passed that Zechariah is like, you know, I know I've been praying about this whole thing, and an angel from God actually told me that, but I kind of doubt it now. <laughs> it's, it's pretty amazing, right? Because he says that, you know, we're old. I, I need some more proof that this is going to happen. Um, it says, Zacharias in Luke 1.18, Zechariah said to the angel, how will I know this for certain? 
for I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Your, your word's not super good enough for me. Can you do something else? <laughs> right? I, I mean, I, I, we should sympathize with this guy, though, because a lot of times we say, woe is me, don't we? We climb and in, in, in get in the corner of our room and cry, you know, or whatever it is. However you deal with your stress, it feels like it's overwhelming you at the time. Um, we do this stuff, don't we? We do, you know, I don't trust you, God. I, I'm going through too much hard stuff right now. I don't think that you're going to be able to get me through this. You know, I, I, I just seriously have some doubts. And this is how Zechariah is feeling. He's like, I seriously have some doubts. I've been thinking about this for a long time, praying about this for a long time. And now this guy, when I'm an old guy, when I'm an old man, says that my wife's going to be pregnant and we're going to have a son. Right? So he, he has his doubts. Um, Zechariah is putting limits on what God can do in his life. And, and when we have doubts, we're doing the same thing. We're putting limits on what God can do with us. Zechariah doubted the power of his promise. And he could not see how this promise could happen. And we do that same thing, too. We, we put God in a box. We say, it's impossible for God to make something happen. He, he can't do that. That's impossible. You know, I've thought that in my head plenty of times. And plenty of times I've been wrong. Plenty of times God has answered and said, you know, you just didn't have enough faith, buddy. Maybe you should pray more, right? Maybe you should think about what you believe. Zechariah, a righteous and blameless man, puts limits on God. And it's primarily because he wasn't patient. He wasn't thinking about the God, that God had the right timing in his own mind, right? God's timing is right. Just at the right time, he sent Jesus. Things come in the air due time. And sometimes we have to be patient. We have to wait on the Lord, don't we? Right? Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Yes, wait for the Lord. Trust God. Perhaps Zechariah forgot about Abraham and Sarah, uh, but that wasn't his only mistake or not his biggest mistake. It was also that he asked Gabriel for proof, right? That... <laughs> The angel was speaking to him the truth. And the angel uh, ended up rebuking Zechariah, and he silenced him for nine months. It's like, no, you can't talk anymore. He was unable to speak. No more words for you, right? <laughs> yeah, you wish you could do that sometime with your kids, right? If they're yelling at you and the side of your head, and you're like trying to concentrate on something, it's like, nah, 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 you know? Dad, 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 dad. <laughs> and you're just like, shh. <laughs> Doesn't happen though, right? Um, <laughs> so Zechariah was blameless, righteous, but he still made mistakes and God disciplined him. He, he silenced Zechariah. Uh, and you can imagine Zechariah probably did a lot of thinking, a lot of listening uh, over those nine months. It's a lot of time for reflection, a lot of time for peace, right? Our mouths get us into a lot of trouble sometimes, don't they? I know I talk too much sometimes, you know? I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that, you know? But I did. <laughs> the words got out. Um, sometimes not having something that we like to have is a blessing. Not speaking for instance, gives us the opportunity to meditate on God's word, to hear others instead of waiting for the chance to talk over them, right? There are so many places in the Bible that tell us that talking is not all it's cracked up to be. And I feel a little hypocritical up here right now. I'll be, <laughs> be honest with you that I'm talking. Um, there is great value in silence and in listening, right? Here's a couple of verses to illustrate that point. Uh, Psalm 46.10, be still, be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still, be quiet. 
James 1.19, it says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, right? Because sometimes we talk ourselves up into a rage, don't we? Just get so indignant with ourselves, just can't control our tempers. I think one of the things that's really been hard for me to deal with during this whole thing that we've been dealing with, the virus and the pandemic and all that stuff, is the feeling of maybe a little bit of helplessness, a little bit of isolation. Not being able to do so many of the things that we all took for granted. Not being able to talk to friends as easily or go where I wanted to go. Have conversations as easily as I wanted to have them. Sometimes we're handed things that we don't like. Sometimes bad things happen that we don't appreciate. And I think the pandemic is probably one of those things very little of us have appreciated. But sometimes those negative things present an opportunity to learn something about our faith. To learn something about our faith, to learn something about God, to learn something about ourselves, our relationship to God. The pandemic introduced a time for silence, a time that we could meditate on, on his word. What this um, forced isolation to agree did do, especially early on, is give me time for reflection, give me time for stillness and quiet, to meditate on God's word, to think about what he wants from me in my life. And even though I hated the pandemic, I valued those things, those times when I had them. Going to the opposite end of the spectrum, eventually, Zechariah is able to speak again. When his little baby boy is born, when John the Baptist is born, they want to call him Zacharias. And his wife says, no, no, don't do that. Call him John. They're probably like, oh, he can't, my husband can't talk. Can you imagine? We didn't, <laughs> didn't do what he said. And um, they're like, oh, this, okay, whatever. And they go and ask Zacharias, and they're like, what do you want to call him? And he's like, you know, doing sign language and stuff. And then all of a sudden, his, his mouth opens, and he says, call him John. Call him John. And then Zacharias goes from being super quiet, super silent, to being super loud. And he's got a song. And I want to take a look at that song with all of you. Because going to the opposite side of the spectrum, one other thing I think we can learn from Zechariah is a value of exultation and of praise. Zechariah has a song on his heart, and after he's given back his voice, he shares it to the edification of us all. Let's take a look at this. It says in Luke 1, 67 through 79, And his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from, from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To show mercy toward our fathers and to remember his covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father. To grant us that we, being rescued from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which sunrise on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness, and the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. It's a beautiful song, isn't it? It's a song of jubilation. It's a song of hope. It is a song of remembrance and thanksgiving. It is a song about salvation for the people of God. It is a prophecy about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Exultation and praise of God helps remind us of all that he 
is doing for us and all that he's going to do for us? Is there a reminder of why we're all here in the first place? When we sing praises to God, we think about the words, all the things that God has done in our lives personally. Is a reminder that our faith and our trust is not misplaced, that we're here for a higher purpose, for a bigger reason than just ourselves. It's acknowledging our God. You know, we can learn so much from Zechariah that is meaningful and helpful to our own walk with God. We can learn that God does not forget. He remembers us. We can learn that we must be patient. We can learn that everyone makes mistakes and that sometimes we doubt. We can learn a lot from silence and reflection, from meditating on God's word. And we can learn the power of praise. So many things from such a little known guy. So as you go out and you tackle this week, remember some of the lessons Zechariah has taught us. Remember that God is always with you. Don't doubt that he loves you and that he wants what is best for you, even if you're going through something hard right now, something challenging. Learn from it. Gain strength from it. Grow closer to God because of it. Let it bring you in a relationship with him, not drive you apart. At this time, I uh, will offer an invitation. If you believe in the promise of God that he sent his son to die for your sins, the son Jesus Christ, if you believe in him as your Lord and your Savior, if you're willing to repent, that is to change your heart and your mind towards God, willing to be baptized out of commitment to God, and God has promised that he will forgive your sins that you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and that you will have eternal life. That is the promise of the Lord. That is the thing of which we all are waiting patiently. So if that is something that's on your heart to do this morning, I want to encourage you to come forward as we stand and we sing our closing song, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand.